The question, who's got the mic? Where's the microphone? That's our magic. Uh, you got it? Go ahead. This clause that prevents immunity from prosecution, it doesn't seem to be quite ex post facto because the immunity clause itself was granted to give immunity for that which was illegal when it was done. Uh, can a new Congress eliminate that clause? I don't think there's any doubt. Anybody doubt that? Yeah. Yeah. It also doesn't affect international liability. And, and Philippe Sand said, tied the get out of jail card, as we refer to it, to the Military Commissions Act. You had essentially the same provision in the 2005 Detainee Treatment Act in Section 1004. Essentially the same thing. Uh, if a reasonable man acted on the advice of his lawyer, could assume that what he was doing was lawful. And, and a number of other criteria. But you had to get out of jail card, both in the Detainee Treatment Act and in the Military Commissions Act. Do we think Congress could, could uh, do away with that? I think the answer to that is yes. The one thing that, that could immunize uh, offenders uh, within the United States is a presidential pardon. That's absolute. Uh, and that, I think, would also preclude extraditing someone who had been pardoned for trial elsewhere. But that would be the only uh, protection, and that, again, wouldn't protect them overseas. Who's got the mic now? Oh, yeah. So there's a very interesting difference between the way we think in the United States and the way the Israeli Supreme Court and have analyzed the same problem in 2006. Right. So they had a problem of alleged torture by the Secret Service. Uh, and they, uh, they, their techniques were listed. And maybe they were, maybe they weren't tortured. But that's not the question. They said that's not the question. The first question is whether they were authorized to carry out this form of interrogation. And what does the authorized interrogation imply? Is this necessary for the sake of interrogation? Some things are necessary, some things are not necessary. Some things are conventionally acceptable as interrogation, other things are not. Now that question seems to me preliminary to the question whether you're violating some international taboo. The question is whether you are domestically authorized. Now, can you explain to me why we don't think this way in the United States that we assume that the authority is unlimited, and we only ask whether it runs afoul of some specific prohibition. Anybody want to take that? Well, I, I think that uh, if your question is why we assume that, is your question is that we assume that it's authorized and if it's authorized we can engage in it and the only liability that we face is an international liability? George? It's the same thing as police interrogation. Until police interrogation violated the Fourth Amendment, we just assumed that the police interrogation was properly authorized uh, until the ground follows some constitutional prohibition. So uh, the same, I think we have the same manner of thinking in the international sphere. Now, uh, I don't completely understand how this could be true with regard to executive departments, which are of limited authority. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not absolutely certain that there was a consensus view that uh, what was authorized was in fact authorized. And indeed, there were many people within the Pentagon who, uh, who said that regardless of whether it's authorized or not, it's our view that it's unlawful. And we don't think unlawful behavior on the part of U.S. government officials is authorized. There was a lot of give and take on that, that particular point. It wasn't just international liability that we were concerned about. It was subjecting uh, the president, the cabinet officers, and, and certain other officials to liability domestically as well. So I don't think there was an assumption that simply because someone somewhere had authorized it domestically, it was good to go. No, that's not my question. Yeah. Of course you can impose criteria against behavior around uh, the law of the But even before we get there, you have to ask the question whether internally it is authorized. Are you allowed to do that? Where, where do you get the authority to do that, even if you haven't violated any prohibitions? Yeah, I, I think uh, okay. this ties into some of the discussion of the, the first panel. I mean, if you approach the Constitution from the assumption that the federal government only does the things that are enumerated, that it is a government of limited powers, where, whereas states are, are far more empowered to have residual powers, uh, that becomes a relevant question. I, I recall thinking about the, the same thing this way, that in marketing the law of war, for a judge advocate, uh, often I found that your, your task was to market the law of war sometimes to, to its uh, end users, to commanders. And I found it a helpful 
tool to point out that military necessity was not something that we needed to, to consider, or necessity generally was not something we needed to consider apart from the law, but the genius of the law of war that is, is that necessity is woven into the law, that all the things that the law admits, all the things that the conventions or the Hague Conventions uh, permit forces to do on the ground uh, account for uh, the, the, the end game of, of war, which is to, to win and, and to do all the things that are necessary on, on the battlefield to accomplish the objective, to, to vindicate for, for whatever reason it is that you find yourself on the battlefield. I found that that resonated. That the commanders were able to understand that they didn't need to make a separate necessity calculation apart from the law. The laws that it was incorporated actually into these standards. But, but, the, but the question does relate back to why we opened this symposium with a with a discussion of the unitary executive concept, and I, I don't think you were here for that. But there was certainly a discussion amongst the panel uh, in the morning session as to whether the president is imbued with certain authority acting on the unitary executive principle when he functions as commander in chief exercising his Article II constitutional authority. That's what I think your question goes to. And I think there's a wide difference of opinion with respect to what that inherent authority is and how far he can take that authority.